How glad I am he didn't uh, end with shithead. That was my fear. <laughs> JSF, shithead. That's how I sometimes feel when JSF writer sits down in the morning. Um, I'm going to read from the very, very beginning of the book, the first chapter of the book. What about a tea kettle? Oh, actually, I should more properly thank everybody for coming. This is very, <laughs> if you like that, you're going to love what I'm about to do, by the way. Um, it's really incredible, you know, because you write in such solitude, and I write in such solitude, and I have in my head the idea that maybe somebody will be on the other end of the experience, and then in a very abstract way, you know that there are people on the other end because you see books in bookstores, and very occasionally you see somebody reading your book, which is especially strange. Um, but to see a number of people in one room, especially in a foreign country, and you knowing that people are primarily reading it in another language, I just could never describe how strange it is and how incredibly wonderful it is. Um, I can't remember which Woody Allen movie it is, but there's a movie in which he is confessing his love to somebody, I think to Diane Keaton, and he says, I love you, and then he says, no, no, that's not the right thing, that's not what I want to say, that's not quite enough. He says, I loof you, I, I lift you, I, I laugh you, and he keeps trying to find a word that's just a little bit stronger than love. And so, I would say I thank you in that word. What about a tea kettle? This that I'm about to read is um, the first chapter, as I said, and I don't usually care for readings very much. Um, I hardly ever go to them myself, and when I'm given the choice, I prefer something like what we're going to do with Peter in a minute, which is a, a conversation when ideas can come out, because I haven't, I've never really understood the good of readings, to be perfectly honest. You know, if you want to hear something, you can read it out loud to yourself, or you can buy... <laughs> the audio version. <laughs> what about a tea kettle? Which was not the original beginning of this book. Um, I began this book originally, I was obsessed with the idea of a powerful opening, um, something that you would read and say, this is a great book that I'm opening. Like, what about, I, no, not like that. Like, um, call me Ishmael or all happy families, blah, blah, blah. And I had lots and lots of beginnings like that. And it, I remember one of them was Oscar saying something about how he wasn't very good at living, but he was very good at inventing. And I thought, yeah, that's right. That really gets at what I'm trying to say. It describes it very well. And one of my very, very bad habits is to um, meet people for lunch or for drinks or something and give them whatever I'm working on and say, here, you know, maybe you're interested in what I've been working on. And... They'll say, oh, thanks, and they'll take it from me, and I'll say, why don't you just read the first couple sentences while I'm sitting here? And I'll pass it across the table and force them to read it while I'm looking at them. And what I noticed is that people would read the beginning, and that was fine, and then they'd get to, what about a tea kettle? And they would start to smile, and they'd start to get into it, and I could see that they were reading faster, pushing on. And um, it occurred to me, why not start there? Why not just start running. You know, there's no reason to get into that crouching position where you're about to take off and wait for the gun. You might as well, in a book, you don't have to do that. You can start anywhere you want, and you can start right in the middle of a thought. And so that's what I thought. What about a tea kettle? Um, I'd had a fantasy when my first book came out of doing a reading in which I only read the first sentence over and over, and I interjected between times I read the first sentence thoughts, like the ones I'm giving right now. And I thought, ideally, I would be able to sustain this for an entire reading and then say the first sentence and say thank you very much and sit down and that that would be very impressive. <laughs> As it turns out, I just don't have that much to say. Peter had a suggestion for, for possible alternate reading when I was, um, we were talking in the little room downstairs before. I would be curious to know what it was. How could that possibly be? <laughs> well, you wrote it yourself. It's page 152, 153. Well, that would be one way of doing it. But you wrote. Nope. 
going to stick to the original plan. I was before I, I started. I had dinner with my publisher, and we were talking about possible things to do at a reading because I just don't have that much banter in me. I don't have that many jokes to tell. I don't. It's I, I'm always. I've had a very unsettling experience a number of times in my life, which is meeting somebody and them saying to me, "Boy, you're really not like your books at all." Like, <laughs> I'm very surprised you're the person who wrote those books because the books seem very funny and full of life and. <laughs> I just know that's not what I am. Um, and so I tried to think of some sort of shtick or something I could do. And um, Chris told me that Paul Oster had read here, and he read the first page of each of his novels. And he said, that's a good idea. You could do that. <laughs> Except I've only written two novels. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to stick with a very straightforward reading. What about a tea kettle? What if the spout opened and closed when the steam came out and it would become a mouth and it could whistle pretty melodies or do Shakespeare or just crack up with me? I could invent a tea kettle that reads in dad's voice so I could fall asleep or maybe even a set of kettles that sings the chorus of Yellow Submarine, which is a song by the Beatles, who I love because entomology is one of my raisons d'etre, which is a French expression that I know. Another good thing is I could train my anus to talk when I fart in. If I wanted to be extremely hilarious, I'd train it to say, wasn't me. <laughs> Audiences really reveal themselves with that line. Every time I made an incredibly bad fart. And if I ever made an incredibly bad fart in the Hall of Mirrors, which is in Versailles, which is outside of Paris, which is in France, obviously, my anus would say, ce n'était pas moi. What about little microphones? I mean, what if everyone swallowed them and they played the sounds of our hearts through little speakers, which could be in the pouches of our overalls? When you skateboarded down the street at night, you could hear everyone's heartbeat and they could hear yours, sort of like sonar. Actually, a sort of weird interjection here is that I got a letter from somebody in the mail about a week ago, and he said, you know that line where you say when you skateboard down the street at night, you can hear everyone's heartbeat? I was just wondering, have you ever heard of the band Pavement? Because there's this song on this album called Crooked Rain, and the song is called Range Life. There's a bit about somebody skateboarding down the street, and for whatever reason, it reminded me of that. And I was wondering if you'd ever heard that. The thing is, that must have been what I was referring to, because I used to love that song. It never crossed my mind when I was writing the book. It was the, you know, absolutely, I, had never, I hadn't thought of it since high school until this guy sent a letter. And then I read his letter, and I realized we were having the exact same intuition, just that I committed mine you know, to print. Um, one weird thing is I wonder if everyone's hearts would start to beat at the same time, like how women who live together have their menstrual periods at the same time, which I know about but don't really want to know about. <laughs> that would be so weird, except that the place in the hospital where babies are born would sound like a crystal chandelier in a houseboat because the babies wouldn't have had time to match up their heartbeats yet. And at the finish line, at the end of the New York City Marathon, it would probably sound like war. Anyway, my first jujitsu class was three and a half months ago. Self-defense was something I was extremely curious about for obvious reasons, and mom thought it would be good for me to have a physical activity, activity besides tambourining. So my first jujitsu class was three and a half months ago. There were 14 kids in the class, and we all had on neat white robes. We practiced bowing, and then we were all sitting down, Indian style, and then Sensei Mark asked me to go over to him. Kick my privates, he told me. That made me feel self-conscious. Excuse him, why? I told him. He spread his legs and told me, I want you to kick my privates as hard as you can. He put his hands at his sides and took a breath in and closed his eyes, and that's how I knew that actually he meant business. No way, Jose, I told him. And inside I was thinking, what the? He told me, go on, guy, destroy my privates. Destroy your privates? With his eyes still closed, he cracked up a lot and said, you couldn't destroy my privates if you tried. That's what's going on here. This is a demonstration of the well-trained body's ability to absorb a direct blow. Now please, destroy my privates. I told him, I'm a pacifist. <laughs> and since most people my age don't even know what that means, I turned around and told the others, I don't think it's right to destroy people's privates ever. <laughs> Sensei Mark said, can I ask you something? I turned back around and told him, well, you know, technically, can I ask you something? Is asking me something. <laughs> he said, do you have dreams of becoming a jujitsu master? No, I told him. 
he said, do you want to know how a jujitsu student becomes a jujitsu master? I want to know everything, I told him, but that isn't true anymore either. He told me a jujitsu student becomes a jujitsu master by destroying his master's privates. Very Freudian. You should have him read here, actually. He would be really great. I told him, that's fascinating. My last jujitsu class was three and a half months ago. I really desperately wish I had my tambourine with me now because even after everything, I'm still wearing heavy boots and sometimes it helps to play a good beat. My most impressive song that I can play on my tambourine is The Flight of the Bumblebee by Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, which is also the ringtone I downloaded for the cell phone I got after Dad died. It's pretty amazing that I can play The Flight of the Bumblebee because you have to hit incredibly fast in parts and that's extremely hard for me because I don't really have wrists yet. Ron offered to buy me a five-piece drum set. Ron is Oscar's mother's friend, possibly boyfriend. Money can't buy me love, obviously. But I asked if it would have Zildjian symbols. He said, whatever you want. And then he took my yo-yo off my desk and started to walk the dog with it. I know he just wanted to be friendly, but it made me incredibly angry. Yo-yo moi, I told him, grabbing it back. And what I really wanted to tell him was, you're not my dad and you never will be. Isn't it so weird, if you think about it, how the number of dead people is increasing even though the earth stays the same size so that one day there isn't going to be room to bury anyone anymore? One fascinating thing is that I read in National Geographic that there are more people alive now than have died in all of human history put together. In other words, if everyone wanted to play Hamlet at once, they couldn't because there aren't enough skulls. So. What about skyscrapers for dead people that were built down? They could be underneath the skyscrapers for living people that are built up. You could bury people 100 floors down and a whole dead world could be underneath the living one. And sometimes I think it would be weird if there was a skyscraper that moved up and down while its elevator stayed in place. So if you wanted to go to the 95th floor, you just press the 95 button and the 95th floor would come to you. And also that could be extremely useful because if you're on the 95th floor and a plane hits below you, the building could take you to the ground and everyone could be safe. I've only been in a limousine twice, ever. The first time was really terrible, even though the limousine was really wonderful. I'm not allowed to watch TV at home and I'm not allowed to watch TV in limousines either, but it was still neat that there was a TV there. I asked if we could go by school so Toothpaste and the Minch could see me in a limousine. Mom said school wasn't on the way and we couldn't be late to the cemetery. Why not, I asked, which I actually thought was a good question because if you think about it, why not? Even though I'm not anymore, I used to be an atheist, which means I didn't believe in things that couldn't be observed. I believe that once you're dead, you're dead forever and you don't feel anything and you don't even dream. It's not that I believe in things that can't be observed now because I don't. It's that I believe that things are extremely complicated. And anyway, it's not like we were actually burying him anyway. Even though I was trying hard for it not to, it was annoying me incredibly how grandma kept touching me, so I climbed into the front seat and poked the driver's shoulder until he gave me some attention. What is your designation? I asked in my Stephen Hawking voice. <laughs> uh, say what? He said. He wants to know your name, grandma said from the back seat. He handed me his card. I handed him my card. I told him, greetings, Gerald. I am Oscar. He asked me why I was talking like that. I told him, Oscar's CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. The more contact he has with humans, the more he learns. Does anybody happen to know what that's a quote from? Elf. What was that? Elf is that three times? I haven't even heard of that. Say that again. <laughs> oh, no, come on. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> it's Terminator 2. Um, it's only funny until he's elected president. <laughs> Gerald said, oh, and then he said, K. I couldn't tell if he liked me or not, so I told him, oh, your sunglasses are so cool. He said, yeah. I said, do you know a lot of curse words? He said, I know a couple. I'm not allowed to use curse words. Bummer, he said. Well, what's bummer, I asked. It's like a bad thing. Well, do you know shit? He said, that's a curse, isn't it? And I said, not if you say shit, Taki. <laughs> Guess not, he said. I said, Sakatash my Balzac, dipshitaki. 
Gerald shook his head and cracked up a little, but not in the bad way, which is at me. I can't even say hair pie, I told him, unless I'm talking about an actual pie made out of actual rabbits. Hey, cool driving gloves. Yeah, he said, and then I thought of something, so I said it. Actually, if limousines were extremely long, they wouldn't even need drivers. You could just get in the back seat, walk through the limousine, and get out at the front seat, which would be where you wanted to go. So in this situation, the front seat would be at the cemetery. And I would be watching the game right now, he said. I patted his shoulder and I told him, when you look up hilarious in the dictionary, there's a picture of you. <laughs> I used to say that all the time when I was a kid. It was the most annoying thing I knew how to do <laughs> when I wasn't looking up vagina in the dictionary. In the back seat, mom was holding something in her purse. I could tell that she was squeezing it because I could see her arm muscles. Grandma was knitting white mittens and I suspected they were for me even though it wasn't cold out. I wanted to ask mom what she was squeezing and why she had to keep it hidden. I remember thinking that even if I were suffering hypothermia, I would never, ever put on those mittens. Now that I'm thinking about it, I told Gerald, they can make an incredibly long limousine that had its back seat at your mom's VJ and its front seat at your grave and be exactly as long as your life. Gerald said, true, but if everyone lived like that, no one would ever meet anybody, right? I looked up at the limousine sunroof, and I imagined the world before there were ceilings, which made me wonder, does a cave technically have no ceiling, or is a cave technically all ceiling? I crawled back because it's dangerous to drive and talk at the same time, especially on the highway, which is what we were on. Grandma started touching me again, which was annoying, even though I didn't want it to be. Mom, yes, I have a question. Okay, ask her. What are you squeezing in your purse? She pulled out her hand and opened it, and it was empty. Just squeezing, she said. Even though it was an incredibly sad day, she looked so, so beautiful, and I kept trying to figure out a way to tell her that, but all the ways I thought of were weird and wrong. She's wearing the bracelet that I made for her, and that made me feel wonderful, because I love making jewelry for her, because it makes her happy, and making her happy is another one of my raisons d'etre. It isn't anymore, but for a really long time, it was my dream to take over the family jewelry business. Dad constantly used to tell me I was too smart for retail. That never made any sense to me because he was smarter than me. So if I was too smart for retail, then he really must have been too smart for retail. I told him that. First of all, he told me I'm not smarter than you. I'm more knowledgeable than you. And that's only because I'm older than you. Parents are always more knowledgeable than their children. And children are always smarter than their parents. Well, unless the child's a mental retard, I told him. <laughs> One of my recurring nightmares, by the way, is walking into a facility for mentally retarded people and not realizing it and giving a reading and <laughs> coming to that line and then realizing it. <laughs> Dad didn't have anything to say about that. You said, first of all, so what, second of all? Second of all, he said, if I'm so smart, then why am I in retail? Well, that's true, I said. And then I thought of something, but wait a minute, Dad. It won't be the family jewelry business if no one in the family's running it, he told me. Sure it will. It'll just be someone else's family. And I asked, well, what about our family? Are we going to open a new business? He said, we'll open something. I thought about that my second time in a limousine when we were on the way to dig up Dad's empty coffin. A really great game that Dad and I would sometimes play on Sundays was Reconnaissance Expedition. Sometimes the Reconnaissance Expeditions were extremely simple, like when he told me to bring back something from every decade of the 20th century. I was very clever and brought back a rock. And sometimes they were incredibly complicated and would go on for a couple of weeks. For the last one we ever did, which never finished, he gave me a map of Central Park. I said, and? And he said, and what? I said, well, what are the clues? He said, who said there had to be clues? And I said, well, there are always clues. And he said, that doesn't in itself suggest anything. And I said, but not a single clue. He said, unless no clues is a clue. Well, is no clues a clue? He shrugged his shoulders like he had absolutely no idea what in the world I was talking about, and I loved that. I spent all day walking around the park looking for something that might tell me something, but the problem was I didn't know what I was looking for. I went up to people and asked if they knew anything I should know, because sometimes Dad would design reconnaissance expeditions, so I'd have to talk to people. But everyone I went up to was just like, what the... I looked for clues around the reservoir. I read every poster on every lamppost and tree. I inspected the descriptions of the animals at the zoo. I even made kite flyers reel in their kites so I could examine them, although I knew that was improbable. But that's how tricky Dad could be. There was nothing, which would have been unfortunate unless nothing was a clue. 
That night we ordered Chinese for dinner and I noticed that dad was using a fork even though he was perfect with chopsticks. Hey, wait a minute, I said, and I stood up and I pointed at his fork. Is that fork a clue? He shrugged his shoulders, which to me meant, this fork is a major clue. So I ran to my laboratory, got my metal detector out of its box in the closet. Because I'm not allowed to be in the park alone at night, Grandma went with me. I started at the 86th Street entrance and walked in extremely precise lines, like I was one of the Mexican guys who mowed the lawn, so I wouldn't miss anything. I knew the insects were loud because it was summer, but I didn't hear them because my earphones covered my ears. It was just me and the metal underground. Every time the beeps would get close together, I'd tell Grandma to shine the flashlight on the spot. Then I'd put on my white gloves, take my hand shovel from my kit, and dig extremely gently. When I saw something, I used a paintbrush to get rid of the dirt, just like a real archaeologist would. Even though I only searched a small area of the park that night, I dug up a quarter and a handful of paper clips, and what I thought was the chain from a lamp that you pull to make the light go on, and a refrigerator magnet for sushi, which I know about but wish I didn't. I put all of the evidence in a bag and marked on a map where I'd found it. When I got home, I examined the evidence in my laboratory under my microscope one piece at a time. A bent spoon, some screws, a pair of rusty scissors, a toy car, a pen, a key ring, broken glasses for somebody with incredibly bad eyes. I brought them to Dad, who was reading the New York Times at the kitchen table, marking the mistakes with his red pen. Weapons of mass destruction. Here's what I found, I said, showing him the tray of evidence. Dad looked at it and nodded. I asked, so? He shrugged his shoulders like he had absolutely no idea what he was talking about, and he went back to the paper. Dad, can't you even tell me if I'm on the right track? He shrugged his shoulders again, but Dad, if you don't tell me anything, how can I ever be right? He circled something in an article and said another way of looking at it would be, how could you ever be wrong? He got up to get a drink of water, and I examined what he'd circled on the page, because that's how tricky he could be. It was in an article about the girl who had disappeared and how everyone thought the congressman who was humping her had killed her. A few months later, they found her body in Rock Creek Park, which is in Washington, D.C., but by then, everything was different, and nobody cared anymore except for her parents. So in this article, he circles the words and not stop looking. It was not a mistake. It was a message to me, so I went back to the park every night for the next three nights. I dug up a hair clip and a roll of pennies and a thumbtack and a coat hanger and a nine-volt battery and a Swiss army knife and a tiny picture frame and a tag for a dog named Turbo and a square of aluminum foil and a ring and a razor and an extremely old pocket watch that was stopped at 5.37, although I didn't know if it was a.m. or p.m. But I still couldn't figure out what it all meant. The more I found, the less I understood. I spread the map out on the dining room table and held down the corner with glasses of water. The dots from where I'd found things looked like the stars in the universe. I connected them like an astrologer, and if you squinted your eyes like a Chinese person, it kind of looked like the word fragile. Fragile. Weird. What was fragile? Was Central Park fragile? Was nature fragile? Were the things that I found fragile? I mean, a thumbtack isn't technically fragile. I wonder if a bent spoon would be considered fragile. I erased and I connected the dots in a different way to make door. And so I thought, fragile door. Then I thought of port, which is French for door, obviously. So I erased the dots and connected them to make that. And then I had the revelation that I could connect the dots to make cyborg and platypus and boobs and even Oscar, if you were extremely Chinese. I could connect them to make almost anything I wanted, which meant I wasn't getting any closer to anything, and now I'll never know what I was supposed to find. And that's another reason I just can't sleep. But anyway, a few weeks after the worst day, I started writing lots of letters. I don't know why, but it was one of the only things that made my boots lighter. One weird thing is that instead of using normal stamps, I used stamps from my collection, including my most valuable ones, which sometimes made me wonder if what I was really doing was trying to get rid of things. The first letter I wrote was to Stephen Hawking. I used a stamp of Alexander Graham Bell. Dear Stephen Hawking, can I please be your protege? Thanks, Oscar Shell. I thought he wasn't going to respond because he was such an amazing person and I was so normal. But then one day I came home from school and Stan the doorman handed me an envelope and said, you've got mail, in the AOL voice I taught him. I ran up the stairs to our apartment, ran to my laboratory, went into my closet, turned on the flashlight and opened it. The letter inside was typed, obviously, because Stephen Hawking has amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, unfortunately. Thank you for your letter. 
Because of the large volume of mail I receive, I am unable to write personal responses. Nevertheless, know that I read and save every letter with the hope of one day being able to give each the proper response it deserves. Until that day, most sincerely, Stephen Hawking. Dad always used to tuck me in and he'd tell the greatest stories and we'd read the New York Times together and sometimes he'd whistle, I am the walrus. One thing that was so great was how we could find a mistake in every single article we looked at. Sometimes they were grammar mistakes, sometimes they were mistakes with geography or facts, and sometimes the article just didn't tell the whole story. I loved having a dad who was smarter than the New York Times, and I loved how my cheek could feel the hairs on his chest through his t-shirt, and how he always smelled like shaving, even at the end of the day. Being with him made my brain quiet. I didn't have to invent anything. When dad was tucking me in that night, the night before the worst day, I asked if the world was a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise because that's from the beginning of a brief history of time. Excuse me, he said. Well, Dad, it's just that, you know, like, why does the earth stay in place instead of falling through the universe? Is this Oscar I'm tucking in? Has an alien stolen his brain for experimentation? I said, we don't believe in aliens. He said, the earth does fall through the universe. You know that, buddy. It's constantly falling toward the sun. That's what it means to orbit. So I said, obviously, but why is there gravity? And he said, I don't understand your question. And I said, well, what's the reason? He said, who said there had to be a reason? Well, it's just, if there isn't a reason, then why does the universe exist at all? He said, because of sympathetic conditions. Well, then why am I your son at all? Because your mom and I made love and one of my sperm fertilized one of her eggs. I said, excuse me while I regurgitate. Don't act your age, he said. And I said, well, what I don't get is why do we exist? I don't mean how, but why? I watched his thoughts orbit around his head. He said, we exist because we exist. And I said, what the? And he said, we could imagine all sorts of universes unlike this one, but this is the one that happened. I understood what he meant, and I didn't disagree with him, but I could not agree with him either. Just because you're an atheist, that doesn't mean you wouldn't love for things to have reasons for why they are. I turned on my shortwave radio, and with Dad's help, I was able to pick up someone speaking Greek, which was really nice. We couldn't understand what he was saying, but we lay there, looking at the -the glow-in-the-dark constellations on my ceiling, and listened for a while. The front page was spread over us like a blanket. There was a picture of a tennis player on his back, who I guess was the winner, but I couldn't really tell if he was happy exactly or sad. The moment before Dad started a story was my favorite moment. And when he finished the story... We turned the radio back on and found someone speaking French, which was especially nice because it reminded me of the vacation we just came back from, which I wish never ended. After a while, he asked me if I was awake. I told him no, because I knew he didn't like to leave until I'd fallen asleep, and I didn't want him to be tired for work in the morning. He kissed my forehead and said goodnight, and then he was at the door. Dad, I said. He turned around. Yeah, buddy. And I said, well, nothing really. The next time I heard his voice was when I came home from school the next day. We were let out early because of what had happened. I wasn't even a little bit panicky because both mom and dad worked in Midtown and grandma didn't work, obviously, so everyone I loved was safe. I know that it was 1018 when I got home because I look at my watch a lot. The apartment was so empty and so quiet. As I walked to the kitchen, I invented a lever that could be on the front door, which would trigger a huge spoked wheel in the living room to turn against metal teeth that would hang down from the ceiling so it would play beautiful music like maybe Fixing a Hole or I Want to Tell You and the apartment would be one huge music box. After I petted the cat for a few seconds to show him that I loved him, I checked the phone messages. I didn't have a cell phone yet and when we were leaving school, my friend told me he'd call to let me know whether I was going to watch him attempt skateboarding tricks in the park or we were going to go look at magazines in the drugstore with the aisles where no one can see what you're looking at, which I didn't feel like doing, but still. Message 1, Tuesday, 8.52 a.m. Is anybody there? Hello. It's Dad. If you're there, pick up. I just tried the office, but no one was picking up. Listen, something's happened. I'm okay. They're telling us to stay where we are and wait for the firemen. I'm sure it's fine. I'll give you another call when I have a better idea of what's going on. I just wanted to let you know, I'm okay, I'm fine, so please don't worry. No reason to worry. I'm fine. I'll call you again soon. There were four more messages from him. One at 9.12, one at 9.31, one at 9.46, and one at 10.04. I listened to them, and I listened to them again. 
And then, before I had time to figure out what to do, or even what to think or feel, the phone started ringing. It was 10.22 and 27 seconds. I looked at the caller ID and saw that it was him. Thank you. Yesterday, um, Jonathan and I were having dinner and we were discussing what we would do today, what he would do today. Well, you see that he doesn't do what I want him to do. Um, and he told me, told me a story about that. He said, well, I once, I didn't know whether you saw it actually or whether you just heard the story, but this was a dance performance. And in this dance performance, the director or, or the choreographer let loose dogs on stage and then saw what the dancers did with that. They had to improvise and Jonathan said, well, think of this evening as that, as a dance performance with dogs. And I told him that we had something like that in Holland too, uh, one of our famous uh, television artists but also uh, in a, many other ways an artist, Wimte Schippers, once put up a show in which he had dogs play the roles of actors or had dogs acting. And they were very well directed and in the end I don't think they stayed where they should be, but they were directed and I'd like to say that to you that I prefer my dogs directed. And therefore I will start this question and answer with uh, some old-fashioned, informative questions, just so that you know. Okay, you can't see. It should be possible, I think. Oh. But I think I sh we should be a little bit to that side, because um, then we are a little bit more in the middle. It's true that we are more on the left side than the rest on the right side. I think this is about to where we can go without um, ripping the um, threats from stage. So this is what it should be. I'm sorry. There's actually nothing to see anyway. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can hear what is being said. As long as you hear the dogs barking exactly. uh, to stay in the metaphor. Um, what I first wanted to ask you, uh, we heard this um, first chapter of your novel and everything's in it. Um, the plot, and especially the voice, the voice of this precocious nine-year-old boy. And what I wanted to know is whether the book actually started with this voice, because it's such a strong voice, and Oscar is such a strong personality. Did you have this person in your head, and did the novel evolve from that? Actually, not at all. Um, I was working on a very, very different book, and the... I can't believe I was working on it because I get embarrassed every time I describe it. It was such a terrible idea, but it was, um, it's not even worth getting into. But it was a very, very <laughs> okay. different book, and Oscar had nothing to do with it. And what happened was, I don't remember what, quite what inspired me but to, to start writing in this voice, but I did, and it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with the book at first, and then it was kind of on the periphery of the book and I sent it to a friend, just the first couple of pages. I said, isn't this kind of funny? He said, yeah, that is really funny. And then I wrote some more and I sent it to a couple of other friends and I found myself wanting to send it to friends. And I thought, well, why do I want to send it to friends? And what does it say that I want to send it to friends? Um, I think it says it's something I care about and that has so much to do with the way that I think about writing is um, wanting to write things that I can send to my friends. Um, I don't think about readers when I write. Well, um, friends are readers, of course. Friends are readers. Is that what you said? Yes, and yeah. readers are friends. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all friends are readers. Not all readers are friends. I can okay. actually prove that now. Thank you for this lesson. Um, <laughs> but um, I liked how it made me feel, writing something that I wanted to share. And I just found that the more I wrote Oscar, the more I wanted to write Oscar, the more I wanted to share him. And 
I don't think anybody could ever overstate how hard it is to write something over a long period of time. Um, you know, 50, more than 50% of marriages end in divorce, right? After I don't know how long, but they do. And Well, in the end, 100% of the marriages end in not divorce. In, they end in a separation, okay. but not necessarily in divorce. Divorce is a legal term. Um, Thank you for the... <laughs> Yeah, that'd be seventy-five dollars. Um, Ninety-nine percent of things I start to write don't progress anywhere. I must have written a hundred million first sentences. I mean, it's like my specialty. It's the thing I'm best at in life is writing first sentences. In fact, when we were sitting in the room downstairs, more than once I think I said to somebody, "That would be a great first sentence, or that would be a great title for your book." There's a band that I really used to like in high school called Guided by Voices. Mm -hmm. And before they wrote a single song, they had all of their cover art, the names of all of their songs for their albums. They designed t-shirts. And, <laughs> and that's where the music had to start. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of how I am with books. I, you know, I get really into the idea of what it could be like, what it might look like, what the title would be, how it could possibly begin. I had once even started to write a book of just first chapters because I had so many of these first chapters. Um, although, in fact, it's not interesting. Nobody cares about a first chapter. I mean, it's like you wouldn't want to live your life having crushes. You know, at some point you say, I would like to try to do something a little bit more substantial. And um, There's an Italian writer who wrote a whole book of first chapters. Do you know that? Italo Calvino, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. It's completely yeah, it's consisting of really first, chapters. first chapters. I mean, that's, I, lo I actually love that book. But my only point is when you find something that you don't get tired of immediately. It's not to say you continue to feel the same energy about it as you did in the beginning, but you realize you could stick with it over time, and that's something that's worth committing a lot to. And Oscar, I found that very strongly about Oscar. I think it's, in the beginning, it was because he made me laugh, but ultimately it's because I empathized very, very strongly with him, and I felt like he was a great... Do you mind if this answer gets quite long? No, not at all. I mean, <laughs> as long as the audience doesn't mind. <laughs> I felt like I, I empathized with him very, very, very strongly. Um, I did a reading not that long ago at a high school, and a young man um, said to me, you know, I've been keeping a diary for the last five years, and I take it very seriously. I write in it every day, and it feels really good, really meaningful. But I, I wanted to know if you might have some advice about how I could shift into some more serious writing, like a novel. And I said why would you assume that a novel is more serious than a diary? And I told him what I really believe, which is I think a diary is the most pure form of writing and really the most like, noble form of writing. And if I could write anything, if I were given a choice of writing anything, it would be a diary. And I've tried many times in my life and I've never been able to do it because every time I sit down and write about myself, I suddenly stop sounding like myself. I can't explain it, but if I were to... like. If someone were to, to transcribe what I'm saying right now, I would read it and think that just does not sound like me at all. It has nothing to do with who I am or how I talk. Strangely, when I start writing in the voice of other people, like a nine-year-old or an 85-year-old, I sound a lot like myself. And sometimes the farther I throw my voice, the more I feel like myself talking. And the like, farther away I get from the circumstances of my life into somebody else's life, the more I feel like I'm recording my life, my experience. And Oscar was a case of somebody that I really felt like I was speaking through very, very accurately. Like, I really felt a release. Is he, is he still a nine-year-old then? If you say, well, he, he is speaking very much like myself. Um, you could ask yourself, we've all heard him speak my, in your voice. Um, in what way is he still a nine-year-old? Because he knows so much. He, he's, he's read so much. He's so wise. Is he... Can he exist? Isn't he a, f a sort of fairy tale person? He's a little bit of a fairy tale person. I didn't, you know, if I had wanted to create a realistic nine year old, I could have gone to um, the Neverland Ranch for a couple of months. Not just kidding. <laughs> um, my interest was not in like creating a, a, like a kind of photorealist portrait of a kid, <laughs> um, in part because I'm not sure I would believe it. If I went and, and transcribed a um, I better not use the word dictaphone now that I said that joke. Um, if I transcribed a nine-year-old speaking, okay, so you have this unassailably realistic portrait of mm -hmm. a nine-year-old. Nobody could say anything but that it was a nine-year-old. 
but I'm not sure it would sound like a nine-year-old or feel like a nine-year-old. And so one of the most unusual, like kind of inexplicable things about fiction is that sometimes to evoke reality, you have to sacrifice reality. That in order to suggest something as it feels, you can't present it as it is. You yeah, have to yeah. like tell little lies about it or nudge it in one direction or the other. Um, in the case of Oscar, towards someone who's a little older, someone who's a little younger, someone who's a little more flamboyant than a nine-year-old could be or a little bit more shy than a nine-year-old could be. And then you start to feel the thing. It's not... I mean, there's so many ways of describing anything in the world, any person, any event, like a glass of water. How would a scientist describe a glass of water? Well, it's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It's at this temperature. It's being held in glass and sustained, and et cetera, et cetera. How would a journalist describe water? Well, a journalist is a failed, a failed chemist. I would say, I would say it's liquid in a glass. No, you you can't say glass. It's liquid in a in a holder. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> um, but you know, my only point is that a fiction writer might not appeal to any of those literal things and might just say, "What is water? What is this glass of water like? This glass of water is like." You know when you have to stand in front of lots of people and you get very nervous right at first and you get little goosebumps on your skin? That's kind of what water is like. Or you know when you're driving in a car and you stick your head out the window and open your mouth and all the air comes rushing in? That's kind of what water is like. And like novels are these like series of approximations like that. Like this is kind of what loss is like or this is kind of what the imagination is like or this is kind of what being nine years old is like without actually pointing to something. And at, at, you know, you're not referring to the literal thing. And so. When I was writing Oscar, I wasn't that interested in what a nine-year-old was actually like. I was interested in what a nine-year-old might feel like, or even more, what this nine-year-old might feel like. And um, so I worked backward from all of the like evocations. If I wanted to laugh, then I would say, well, how can I make Oscar to create that effect? Or if I wanted him to um, make you sad in a certain way, how can I create Oscar? It's almost like taking a shadow. I think there are artists who do this actually. No, you know what it's like? It's like um, people do finger puppets mm -hmm. and you contort your hands in all sorts of weird ways knowing what you want the shadow to be like. That's sort of what it's like. You know, I contort this character in all these unusual ways which really aren't natural by anyone's standards in the interest of giving like the shadow of something that really is a believable representation. Yeah, it's interesting because it reminds me and not only me, I think many Dutch people in the audience of one of our famous writers once said, Gerard Reven, who said, echt gebeurd is geen excuus, which you could translate as, really true is not, not an excuse. And that's a little bit what you're, you're saying about mm. how you see this character. Mm. There is, of course, um, a very famous character from world literature who is, well, I don't know how old he is exactly, but it is, it's a child, and he's called Oscar, and instead of with a tambourine, he walks through the world with a tin drum in the famous Gunter Grass novel. Was that a, an influence on this novel of yours? And in how far was it an influence? It was an influence. I have no idea how far it was an influence. I really, I really don't know. Pretty it, far, because you named him It must have after. been, right? But I'm not sure a writer of a book is the best person to answer such a question. How far was it an influence? I don't know. What if I said not at all? Clearly, I would, I would be wrong, right? You know, <laughs> you'd be lying. <laughs> uh, yeah, or I'd just be wrong. I mean, there are situations in which I say things that are clearly untrue, but I'm not lying. You know, if somebody says, "You are alluding to Much Ado About Nothing here." I know I didn't read Much Ado About Nothing. I just could not be alluding to it. But when the person points it out, I can't really refute it. You know, they they are they're right. I see mm -hmm. it in the book. And that's the most interesting thing that happens and the most beautiful thing that happens with books is how they start to move away from the people who make them and into the, not really the possession of people who read them, but this in-between space. And um, The reader strikes back. Yeah. Revenge of the reader. <laughs> Attack of the readers. Yeah. Um, how many more do we have? <laughs> um, the return of the reader. The return of the reader. Okay, okay. Well, we we'll um, keep that. that. So... Did you read Gunter Grass? I did, and I, and I loved the book, and it was hugely influential. But I haven't read it since high school. Mm -hmm. That was when I read it. 
So I wasn't thinking about it, honestly. I mean, it was I not an, an it was not honoring this this great book by naming the characters, giving it the same name as in the in the book. I'll tell you, I wanted to name him Oscar with a, C, and I had it with a C, and it just for whatever aesthetic reason it occurred to me K was nicer. And then I thought, if I'm going to name it Oscar with a K, then I am going to be alluding to this Oscar. And so then the tambourine came into play. But it's really interesting how many decisions in books are based on little things like that, the C to the K. Um, if you go one way, you have to go all the way. Yeah, there's this great... The, Joseph Brodsky once said, the rhyme is smarter than the poet. And I think what he meant is, you know, people write in verse, not only because it sounds pretty to have words at the end of lines rhyme, it's very pleasing to the ear, but because you get put in all of these strange position, positions that force you to choose something you wouldn't have chosen without being in that position. So if you find yourself at the end of a line and you have to rhyme with the word book, you, what you really wanted to do was use the word cup. But now you think, well, that doesn't rhyme with book at all. So crook, snook, you know. <laughs> um, so it's a, writing is a process of crook and snook. It's a process of creating problems for yourself that allow you to exceed your abilities. Like, I don't believe anybody writes anything good on purpose. I just, I don't believe anybody is that smart. I think, like, the very best writers are the ones who put themselves in the way of the most accidents and who come to understand how they can live, like, through a series of accidents. Like, it's like the single person who wants to meet somebody. Well, you don't stay at home. You get out. You leave your house. You go to parties thinking, probably I won't like anybody there, but maybe I will. Maybe I'll run into somebody. And then as it turns out, on the way to the subway, you bump into somebody. And, oh, you dropped your bags. I dropped my bags. Hello. You know? Unfortunately, you don't have to go to that party at all. Uh, <laughs> that's what I do when I write. I have an idea of a destination in mind, but what I'm really hoping for is that along the way, I'm going to bump into all sorts of things that will lead me astray. So this book I was writing, as I told you, could not have been more different and I started bumping into things, and the world started bumping into me. You know, the world changed very dramatically over the course of the last four or five years, particularly the world of New York. So that was like the big accident that redirected my book. You, sa you said that you, had, you started out with writing or, or thinking up, um, I don't know the number anymore, but let's say a zillion first sentences. Do all these first sentences get into the book in the end? In another place, of course. Because they're so beautiful that you have to use them. They get into the book like rain gets into a flower. Like they're not literally there, but... How does rain get into a flower? Is that because it something gets into like the soil and glass? the soil nourishes the roots and the roots make their way up the stem and then there's a bulb. Ah. Um, Thanks for the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I shouldn't tell a Dutch person it's about great. flowers. It's chemistry, right? it's biology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, everything gets in. Everything gets in. This conversation will get in. Everything gets in. But it, they didn't literally get in. Um, mm -hmm. They're sitting on a file on my computer called Castoffs, which um, the way I write books is... I've written two books, I should say. The way I've written my two books is I have a file on my computer called Novel with a number after it, and that's whatever draft I'm on. What's the number at the end? Well... When I was at novel 17, I told my good friend, I am sure I'm going to finish on novel 18. In part, because 18, you know, I don't know if you know this, but in Hebrew, the lettering system, the numbering system uses letters as numerals. And so, like, numerology and Kabbalah and all of this relies on finding, like, linguistic equivalents to numbers. Um, and 18 is life. So that's why, um, for, you know, very, very often Jewish people give... Um, 18 or multiples of 18 as gifts. Um, so what I thought superstitiously, I guess, that would be it. Um, it turned out it was 39. It was, it was twice, no, it's twice plus three. So, <laughs> I uh, could have told you that. <laughs> it's 39 drafts. And um, on another, so Novel 39, that was my book. That's what I printed. That's my, on my computer, that's my done book. It's called Novel 39. And um, I have another file called Castoffs, which is where I put things that aren't total shit. Like, they're not, they're things I might return to one day, not things I know are just kind of, you know. And that ended up being something like 2,800 pages. It was very, very long. And I like a lot of those pages at least as much as I like some of the pages in my book. But it's that thing again about like crushes and commitment. Like, 
Crushes are nice. It's nice to meet new people. You want to have new experiences. It's fun. You feel alive. You feel energized. But you, you have to choose, ultimately. And like I'm somebody who chooses to write novels. And um, it doesn't mean that I assemble my favorite pages. It means like I commit to an argument or I commit to a process. I commit to all of the things that are lost, all of the compromises and the interest of making something that I can share with other people. And so I look at those pages, those 2,800 pages, and some of them, 50 of them, I feel like real sadness. I just wish I could have found a way to share those, but I couldn't. And in a way, that sadness makes me happier about having written a book because I feel like I lost those in the interest of something else. But you could never prune those 2,800 pages down to a novel, to a third novel of 300 pages. I don't think so, no. Hmm. And I think it would be a terrible mistake what I'm, gonna, I'm going to be so tempted to do when I get home is start looking through that for places to begin or... Yeah, that's what I, I would I, do, but I'm no writer. Of course, if I cut it like this, I'd already have 70 pages. Then I'd only have to write so many. And that's... It's great. Yeah, it's a terrible way. Of, <laughs> it's a journalist's dream. <laughs> it's a terrible way of thinking about things. Um, let's talk a bit about what you were alluding to in the final um, part of the first chapter you, you read. Um, this is the, the proposition of the novel. Uh, the father of Oscar died in the, in the uh, World Trade Center crash. Um, your novel is, is probably one of the first novels about, I mean, there were many books about 9-11, but this is probably one of the first novels, and I would even say that it's one of the first, it's the first novel which is really successful in that. Um, did you... Did you think it was a, a risk to write about the 9-11 disaster? I mean, were you afraid that people would say, well, this is too shortly after the, after the event and we have to have 50 years of, of, of mourning before we can get to a novel, let alone a humorous novel? I wasn't afraid because I took it absolutely as a given that that would be the case. You know, I, if I wanted to write a novel that was not going to be um, very severely criticized, I would have written a different novel. You know, I mm -hmm. knew going into it that there would be people who would immediately, in a knee-jerk way, respond to it um, negatively. I don't understand what the risks are. I mean, I know that, I, you know, of course, like, there's the risk that people will say such a thing. Is that really a risk? Like, does that really matter? At the end of the day, I'm on my deathbed. I'm looking back on my days. Oh, dear God. Michiko Kakatani said that about my book. Yeah. She's a famous critic in the States. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who was telling me that his fantasy, she killed one of his books, and his fantasy is, he's like, she's older than me, she's going to die before me, I'm going to go to the cemetery one night, I'm going to dig up her grave, I'm going to put my book in her coffin, and one day somebody's going to dig up her coffin, find her clutching my book, and think, this was her favorite book in life. <laughs> Um, in fact, it doesn't bother me that much. Um, Not enough to open a grave and well, put your own book in. You know, how many books aren't written because people are worried about responses or people are worried that it doesn't fulfill the expectation of a novel or people are worried that it won't be published or people are worried that um, it won't be loved? Or, and how many good novels got all of those things when they were published, you know. It's really terrible, like, the ways that art is prejudged and so many other things are not. Like, the comparison I find myself making a lot is to journalism. And it's four years after the fact, and people are very, very, at the, at the very forefront of a lot of people's minds is the question, is it too soon to write about this? Or is it the domain of art to write about this. Is it wrong to make art out of this? On September 11th, at 9.05 in the morning, there were anchormen standing with microphones at the base of the World Trade Center while it was on fire. And we weren't asking those questions of them. We weren't saying, is it wrong to try to cover this as a journalist, knowing full well what the risks were. And the risks were very much lived out and to the worst 
degree. You know, the news was incredibly alarmist. It was factually inaccurate. It was completely sensationalistic. It was being driven by commerce. You know, um, TV networks were, and the New York Times was charging more for advertising space in the time after September 11th because more people were watching. So they had an interest in making the story dramatic and they had an interest in extending the story as long as possible. What are the risks? People die because of bad journalism. You know, the New York Times and reported... And nobody dies of bad fiction. Books die because of bad fiction. It's not that big a deal. You know, a bad book meets its fate on a shelf or in a garbage can. It's just not that... Or in a grave. Or in a grave. Um, so why are we holding these things to such different standards? Do we think that Tom Brokaw is so much smarter than Philip Roth? Is he better at saying what he wants to say than Philip Roth is? Does he have something more important to say than Philip Roth does? But he I, says it non-fiction-wise. Why do we value non-fiction more than we value fiction? Yeah, I can't answer that. I can't answer <laughs> I it don't. either. And I'm, can, I'm like perpetually stupefied, especially when that kind of devaluation comes from the artistic community. That's where it's coming from. It's coming from writers and it's coming from critics. Those are the people asking the question to my... I don't know if it is to my surprise or to my happiness, when I've been on the road for my book tour talking to readers and talking to people who did have very direct relationships, much more direct than mine, to, September, to the catastrophe, they don't ask those questions. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, that's where my most positive response has come from. Um, so why are artists so suspicious of art? It's the million dollar question. It shouldn't be. They certainly shouldn't be, especially not now when we need art more than we did before. Mm -hmm. Not only in addressing issues like September 11th, when, what are we going to do then? Who's our national storyteller? George Bush? You know? Well, he's a storyteller. He's the person who's going to give the defining national story about what happened, and that, that story is going to be one of anger and a desire for vengeance. It doesn't make any sense. That's not how people experienced it. People experienced it emotionally. They experienced it with sadness. The, I have never met anybody I never spoken to anybody about September 11th whose overriding emotion was anything other than sadness. Um, and it's a story worth telling. And it's a story worth looking at um, because it makes, us, um, it makes us more careful. You know, the things that you look at in novels are things that you're more careful with. It's why the decisions that novelists make about what to write about are so important. If you spend 300 pages with something, you end up caring about it. It's not to say that you end up liking it, but you end up caring about it. You know more about it. That's why we want to look at things, and it's why the real catastrophe is that um, in America, at the very least, we're not. There's no sort of artistic dialogue anymore. Like we publish so many books, so many books. Everybody's writing a book, but we receive very, very few books. I think we were talking about this before that in America, fewer than three percent of the books published every year are in translation. In Germany, it's like 40%. Here, it's probably 35%, 30%, 40%. Certainly, yeah. Um, in Spain, in Italy, in England, it's much higher than um, us as well. And so what's going on? You know, we are becoming talkers and not listeners. And um, it's particularly dangerous when you think about the people we most need to be having conversations with, like the Arab world. And if there's any language we're not translating out of, it's Arabic. You know, the Patriot Act has made absolutely sure of that. It's virtually illegal to translate out of Arabic right now in America. And um, so what's happening is there's no, like, compassionate conversation. It's not through diplomats that we get a sense of what an Arab person, and, you know, what would I be like if I were living in um, Baghdad right now? You know, a 28-year-old, decently educated guy, like, what would that be like? I don't have the faintest clue. How could I have a clue? I haven't read a book by one. Um so we send diplomats, we send soldiers, we send no translators, we send no curators. And because of that, our objective is to kill everybody, to kill every enemy, rather than to converse with every enemy, to mm -hmm. make every enemy not an enemy, but somebody sitting across the table from you. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what we were on before, um, art and the novel. Um, I showed the, no, I didn't show it the, to the audience, they have to look for themselves in the books. Um, I told the audience that there were many illustrations in your books, um, that you worked with uh, special typography, with colors, uh, pages, I mean, this must be a very 
expensive book to even fabricate because there are so many different things in it. Um, but the question, of course, would then be, does literature need all this? Or is, isn't literature, can't it manage on its own? It's a loaded question, as you probably know. Um, why is that not literature on its own? You know, if someone were, if I were a painter and there were words in my painting, I don't think you would ask me if painting could do it on its own. Um, I think that that oh, would, I would, I would have a little frown. I think I would. If, if there it were would text be in a painting, yeah, well, it would be, it would be different. Not that different. I mean, that's a pretty common thing these days. Or if. Um, okay, if you went to ballet, there's a symphony, there are dancers. Can't dancers do it on their own? You know, you go to a theater, they're in costumes. Can't the lines do it on their own? Is it really necessary to have costumes? Or um, you go to a concert. Yeah, like I could go on and on and on and on and on. Um, where different art forms are incorporating other art forms and bringing things together in a way that amplifies the experience. Um, literature has been very resistant to that. Um, the question is, why don't other writers do this? I think... At least for you, the question yeah, is. Um, I think because literature has been so protective of its boundaries that we've come to think of a novel as exactly one thing. When somebody says, I want to write a novel, they have an end in mind, and they work toward that end. Um, first of all, there are novelists who have done it. You know, actually numerous and novelists have done, who have done, a good done it. done Like... Uh, Sebald is probably the most famous example, the most recent example, anyway. Um, I don't think novels need pictures, but I do think we need not to ask the question of, is it okay to have pictures in novels? Um, we should be much more open. Why is it that, you know, if there are anything on earth that should be like a liberal model for thinking, you know, it should be novels. Like that's, it should be the place where any kind of experimentation is encouraged, like wildly encouraged, encouraged with government grants encouraged, you know? We should be lining up, please try it out on me. I want to see if it works. And it's actually become one of the most conservative venues in our culture, like infinitely more conservative than television, like mainstream sitcom television, which is much more willing to experiment and form than even the novel is. Why? My theory is it's because novels are the only art form, writing is the only art that critiques itself in its own language. So a painting is not reviewed with a painting. A song is not reviewed with a song. You don't go to a ballet. It would be a good idea, by the way. But... It might be interesting. But writing is reviewed with writing. Writing is critiqued with writing. And so very often you have writers reviewing writers. And so there's a kind of incentive system to like protect against things that are unlike what you are doing. And it encourages a kind of like status quo. Um, I think there should just be like a universal moratorium on writers reviewing writers. I agree. Um, a actually in Holland, that is usually the case. Um, criticism in Holland, critique is yeah. in Holland is in that case professionalized. So these are critics who write about writers and not mm -hmm. writers who write about writers. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, I've got one more obvious question before I go on to a few quotes from your book to which I like a re reaction. Uh, and the, the obvious one is the title of the book, of course. Um, it's called, Ex and I quote from the <laughs> cover, <laughs> it's called Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Um, I read the book and saw two references to this title. I mean, not direct references, but, but the words um, were seen there, but not completely. Why did you choose this title? What, because obviously there is a lot extremely loud and a lot incredibly close in the book, um, but still I don't get the title completely. I have to say I'm glad you don't, because I don't care for anything in books, whether it's the title or the contents, the first sentence or the last sentence that you get completely. Because once you get something completely, you're done with it. There's just no reason to think about it anymore. And you put it on the shelf and you move on to the next book. My favorite books are books that I continually don't quite get, that I'm frustrated by, excited about, books that make me laugh, books that make me um, feel some kind of anxiety. Um, 
I was saying to somebody the other day, there are probably more perfect books being written now than ever before in history and fewer really great books than ever before in history because we've put such an emphasis on things being clear, on things being well-crafted and understood. And um, that's not really what I love to read. I love to read things that are kind of messy, things that show their seams. Much better to bite off more than you can chew than get it right, you know? And um, so I like titles. This is true from, you know, when I think about titles for my books or other people's books that don't describe the contents of the book but somehow contribute to the meaning of the book. So you read and you think, what does that mean? How does that work? Well, people, are they loud and close with one another? They want to be. Maybe that's what it's going on. Or the buildings somehow, the planes went in, that was loud and close if you were standing near there. And then there are scenes in the book that seem like they might be loud and close and extremely and incredibly, well, Oscar seems to talk in these like real exaggerated forms all the time. And something like that, you know, where like you can keep puzzling over it. It's like I did, I, I did a reading once and um, a woman stood up and she said, I'm here with my book group and, you know, we've just been arguing about this question for so long and just can you please set us to rest? Because I got 26 women in this room and we've been arguing for days. I said, 26 women arguing for days? Isn't that exciting, you know? Why on earth would I end that? That's... <laughs> <laughs> could you could you could you also see the, the the title as a sort of writer's program? Is that what you want to be? Yeah. Ex extremely loud and incredibly close. Um, close as in emotional and extremely yeah. loud as in well typography, all kinds of art into one novel. I think it's what I wanted to be with this book. I don't think it's what I want to be anymore. Um, I think I've changed a lot actually in the in the short time since I wrote that book. Um, I just feel differently as a person and as a writer, which is good because now I'm freed up to try to do something else. But um, when I wrote the book, I had in mind something a friend once told me, which was um, there's a singer he thought was just great, his favorite singer. And I remember he used to say, for my birthday, what I would love is that singer to sing my favorite song like this close to my face as loud as he possibly could. <laughs> just a personal concert, like spit on my face, the whole thing. Then I understood just what he meant. Like, you want something that's just that forceful. I don't want to write a book that is interesting. I don't want to write a book that is a good read. I want to write a book that is like spit on the face. You know, just like that physical, that visceral. Um, books are not really suited to that in the same way that music is. People make love to music. Nobody's ever made love to a book. Um, After a book, probably. I haven't read one like that. <laughs> You're young. <laughs> so I should be the one reading books like that. <laughs> the trial? <laughs> um, while we were on the subject of songs and, and singing, um, I'd like to quote these this few lines from the book. It's from a dialogue. Um, between Oscar and his mother, and he lists uh, a number of things that make him sad. And among these things, he says, beautiful songs. And his mother says, why do beautiful songs make you sad? And he says, because they aren't true. And she says, never. And he says, nothing is beautiful and true. And well, the question could, of course, be, do you think this? And on the other hand, every reader of Extremely Loud knows that you can't mean this because the last chapter of the book is actually called Beautiful and True. So how, where do you stand <laughs> as a writer or as a, or as a human being? First of all, as a writer or as a human being. Isn't that a funny thing to say? <laughs> um, you know, it's, a central con it's Oscar's central conflict and it's the central conflict of the book is what is the imagination? And in a certain way it's a, a, very, a conflict very central to my life. Like what is the imagination? Everything I write is untrue. 
It is, these aren't real. Uh, you write about a character, it's just something on a page. It's ink on a page. There's no Oscar in the world. There's no mother or grandmother. It's not a real thing. Um, maybe because it's unreal, you can control it. You know, it's really under my power to be what I want it to be. Um, to be beautiful or funny or moving or banal, whatever I want. Um, so how can I do that? How can I spend so much time of my life sitting in a room writing things that aren't, that are untrue and beautiful, you know? Or attempting to write things that never happen in the world. And then somebody picks up the book and laughs. And that laugh can be measured by a scientist. You can record it on a tape recorder. It's a real thing. It matters. You know, it's physical. And I know, because it's happened to me, that an untrue book can truly change my life. I can see things differently, I can behave differently, I can treat people I know differently. That's what every writer, I assume, aspires to, is to create all of these fictions which create other kinds of facts. You know, that really, I don't know if books are capable of changing the world, but I can't imagine writing if I weren't trying to do that. And I can't imagine a writer writing and not trying somehow to change the world, even in a very small way, even just changing your life, your own life, through the process of writing. But that's when these things become real and take on weight. And um, it's something we just have to have faith in, we have to believe in. That makes you an optimistic writer then? It makes me... Um, it's like the difference between believing in the um, race and believing in the finish line. You know, I believe in the race. I believe it's a good race to run. I don't know much more than that. Well, I think this is a beautiful ending for the conversation, but um, I had some other quotes from the book, but perhaps it's better to give people in the audience a chance to pose a question, perhaps. Um, there are three mics on every... Um, no, there are three mics, full stop, and there is one on every story, in every story. In every story, there's a mic. Um, if people could come up to the microphone, um, unfortunately I can't see two of the three mics, and so I can't see the people behind. Ah, well, there's an empty mic there, there's an empty mic there, and where's the third microphone? And is there someone behind that microphone? No. I think, Jonathan, that we have been all conclusive that we've said everything we wanted to say. Is there anything you want to say? Give them 20 seconds, somebody will walk up to a microphone. <laughs> okay. I just sit here awkwardly. Ah, prophetic writer we have here. Um, I've just finished a module in um, American Jewish literature, and we define the American Jewish literature by the author and whether he's Jewish or whether he's not, and that's the conclusion we came to. Do you think in the book you've written, you being Jewish, have had some bearing on it? Bearing on it? Bearing on the book. I haven't read it, so I don't know. But right. do you think it's been influenced through? Has my being Jewish affected the book that yes. I wrote? Um, for me, yes, for sure. I'm trying to think if there could be a case in which somebody was Jewish and it didn't affect what they wrote. I guess I'd find that hard to believe. Well, it depends really what we mean by Jewish. You know, if you're Jewish by birth or if you're Jewish by education. There are Jewish people who don't have Jewish parents, and there are Jewish people who have Jewish parents and don't know the first thing about Judaism, and there are probably Jewish people who don't have Jewish parents and don't know the first thing about Judaism, and there are certainly Jewish people who have Jewish parents <laughs> and know a lot about Judaism. Um, are there, by the way, are there Gentiles who can write Jewish books? Well, that's an interesting question. It is. Um, I would say probably yes. Um, I think we were talking today about Paul Oster. Not today. Okay. Paul Oster, a Jew. Salman Rushdie, not a Jew. Paul Oster, a Jewish writer. Salman Rushdie, a Jewish writer. That's my opinion. If why, I stated why is, that clearly. Why is Paul Oster, who's well known in, in this audience because he comes here every two or three years, um, why is he not a Jewish writer? I just mean, I don't know that Judaism has had any particular bearing on his writing. When we think about like a tradition of Jewish comedy or Jewish, when I think of Jewish literature, like what connects 
Kafka and Bruno Schultz and Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, um, I think it's a kind of warmth, a, a kind of argument, kind of out of playing two sides at once. It's, um, it's argument and it's something like almost Talmudic, you know, it's like the study of something, the like a willingness to enter a conversation. All of their books somehow play both sides. And um, how does Paul Auster relate to that? Well, I think of him as a, more of a precise writer, mm-hmm. and I, I should say I really, really like his writing. I don't. This is nothing of a judgment, but he's more of a precise writer rather than a warm and overflowing writer. Um, and it seems less a continuation of, a, of that tradition that I was sort of talking about than maybe somebody like Salman Rushdie, who is way all over the place. And then you start thinking, well, maybe what I'm talking about isn't really Jewish fiction, but immigrant fiction, mm-hmm. you know, fiction from abroad. And it starts to make sense. What do immigrants look for when they come to the country, come to wherever they go to live? They look to make connections. They look to find people to, like, somehow... To be successful. Yeah, to create, to build a life. And that can be reflected in literature through like a kind of searching, a kind of looking for things, a desire to make connections. A connection might be like a, present itself as an argument. Um, I think it's no coincidence also that so much immigrant fiction and so much Jewish fiction is funny because humor is a kind of extension of that search for connections. You know, every joke I think is based in bringing two disparate things together. Like, isn't it funny to think of that and that? Isn't it funny if you imagine this person mm-hmm. in that situation or thinking of this word used in this other context? It's always bringing two things together, which is a kind of, like, it's born out of a kind of longing, like a longing for... Um, unity? Unity. Was this enough of an answer to your question? <laughs> okay. You did well. Thank you. There's another. Well, when I first started reading your, uh, your books, I wrote to my friend who told me about you that it must be painful for you to sometimes be who you are because of the, your kind of disruptions, the kind of things going through your head. That after finishing extremely loud and incredibly close, I thought that it must be so much fun to be you because your imagination is so expansive. And it was so inspiring to me. So I was wondering, what ignites and fuels your imagination? <laughs> what ignites and fuels your imagination? Uh, first, I would say thank you, because you said a lot of really nice things. Um, that made me feel good. I would also say it's a mistake to confuse me for my books or for the things that you read, um, in part because you know, you are responsible for a lot of what you read. It's like when somebody says to me, how did you write about um, a person, how did you write about um, an old person in such a real and true way when you're not an old person? And I say, how did you know I was writing in a real way when you're not an old person? You know, whatever it was Maybe it's an old person who asks you. If a young person asks me a question. Whatever it is in a reader that recognizes something is just the mirror of whatever it is in a writer that creates that thing. Like we're both, we both somehow know about that same thing. And I think it's what writing appeals to is that like connection that a reader and a writer can make um, over things that neither of them know about, um, but both of them know about. Like that thing that comes before where you're born and how old you are and the color of your skin and your race when you live, um, in what country you live. There are things that we know. I know things that people who lived in feudal Japan knew, mm-hmm. you know, and I know things that people who live 200 years from now will know. Um, and I assume that that's what they will be making art about, just as in feudal Japan, that's what they were making art about. And um, it has something to do with me when I write, and it has a lot to do with, um, with the reader. You know, books are not... Um, as I said before, books books are really better than their authors. It's, it's just like a truism. Um, because when I finished the book, it had exactly, it was limited by my imagination. It wasn't liberated by my imagination. When I released the book from my hands and it went out into the world, it was then liberated. And 
it could start to take on all of the meaning that everybody who reads it applies to it, all the life experiences that people have had. I write the word tree. I had a tree in mind. I published the book. There are thousands of trees, you know, tens of thousands of trees, like mental forests all over the place. And trees from where people grew up, you know, trees that you pass on the way to the bus stop, whatever it is, it becomes so rich, so much richer than I could have made it. And um, it's a great thing. It's not like a, I'm not protesting too much. It's not, I'm not trying to say something, this is how I think about it, you know, it, and it's why I'm so, like you, that's why I don't think anybody can, can understand how serious I was being when I was saying thank you for coming tonight, because it's nice to have people come to a reading, but it's much nicer to think about your imagination like liberated so widely. So the real question would be what fuels the reader's imagination then? I think it's when you, you recognize something in a book, you make a connection with it. Um, I was in Japan um, a couple of months ago and I went to a garden in Kyoto and I really felt like the, um, land, the landscape or the gardener was big. You walked through it, it was maybe an acre, two acres. I felt like the person had somehow planted my imagination, my inner life. Like I was just walking through the garden that I would have planted if I had known how to plant a garden, um, or if I had been a genius gardener. And um, what fueled that in him? What fueled it in me? He was born thousands of years before I was born. He wasn't white. He wasn't Jewish. He didn't use the internet. You know, I could name a thousand things that separated us, but there was this one thing that connected us. And that was a garden. And that was the garden. It was what the garden was about. And what fueled him to make it, what fueled me to spend so much time in it, I think it's the desire not to be alone, you know, to, rec to like make connections with other people. And to James Baldwin said that we're so used to thinking of the th things we feel most deeply as being isolating. Like when you're very depressed, you think that nobody is depressed like you. When you're very, very happy, nobody's happy like you. And then you read or you look at paintings or you listen to songs and you realize the things you feel most deeply connect you to other people. They don't isolate you. And I think that's why we go to art, is to be connected in those things we feel most deeply. Got another question. Um, first of all, uh, I loved your book, so thank you for writing it. Um, I have a question about your answer on the first question, and that was about Oscar and his age. And I wasn't completely satisfied with the answer. Um, now, when I was reading the book, that was also a question for me that I thought about a lot because obviously um, a nine-year-old wouldn't write all, all of that down. Um, in the last couple of pages, somewhere there is an example of prospection where um, I think it's his um, grandfather brought his suitcases with the, full of the never sent letters. And he said, and Oscar says, um, still at that time, I don't know what the exact phrase was, he says, uh, still at that time I didn't, it, it didn't come together in my head, I, I didn't figure out yet that he was actually my grandfather. Um, could it be that, um, ha, do you have an idea about how much time there is between that last day and Oscar telling us his story, or is that... Uh, irrelevant, and she would stick to the fairy tale character. I think it's just indeterminate. We don't really know. Is Oscar older when he's writing this? Because he seems to be more knowledgeable than a nine year old or ten year old would be. On the other hand, he's not that much more knowledgeable. He's not an adult. On the other hand, he does seem to know things before they happen, like you're saying. I think that might be the only really explicit time it happens in the book when he says, maybe once or twice else, he'll say, But I didn't know that then. Or I didn't realize at that point what was going to happen. To me, it's not a question that really needs an answer. It doesn't need a definite answer. If it's something you found distracting, then that's a problem. I mean, it shouldn't be distracting. But um, it, what, so much of, it's like um, the old thing, if you kiss somebody and they ask you why you kissed like that, and you say, if you're asking me, I didn't do it right. You know, you wouldn't be asking me if I did it right. A joke that has to be explained is never a funny joke. <laughs> Um, and so no, I'm just willing to accept that it might, it might not have worked exactly for you. Um, and there's not necessarily too much more to, to say about it. I always thought of it as a kind of indeterminate distance. Yeah, he's smarter than his years sometimes. Yeah, he's 
less intelligent or less experienced than his years sometimes. What's important is not how he's a fixed person, but the distance between him and you. You know, the things that we know that he doesn't know, the experiences that we've had that he doesn't have. And that's how I think about characters in books. Like, what they are is one thing, but um, like their real power is in that strange negative space between you and them. Um, how do I relate to this person? You know, how am I like or unlike this person? And that's what a character really is. Okay, we've got time for one last question. There's someone the, at the mic there. And after that, we have to stop because Jonathan still has a lot of signing to do, I think. Um, my question is, um, is there a particular reason that in both of your books, the voice that you use is um, quite um, childlike? Because in, um, for, for instance, Oscar is a child and then Alex sounds quite like a child because he's not a native speaker of English. Was that a particular choice for you or is that just a coincidence? I wouldn't say they're both childlike, they're both limited. They're, they're both kind of naive communicators or frustrated communicators. Um, they both have ideas and feelings way ahead of their ability to communicate them. And there are two reasons. One, I am one of those, you know, and that's why I think I sympathize so strongly with them is I write books because my thoughts and feelings are way ahead of my ability to express myself and I have found having written two books that I get a little bit closer when I write novels than when I speak like right now or when I talk to friends or even when I'm sitting alone and thinking to myself that um, one of the really nice things about novels is how they're not bound by time. It's like, you know, in a in life, you can't know then what you know now. In books, you can know then what you know now. You can reach the end of a book, realize something, and go back to the beginning of the book and change it. So you're able to fix your mistakes. You can insert the joke where it belongs. You can take out the joke where it doesn't belong. Um, you can make your best self, um, which is still not perfect or even close. But if you get like the extra 1% or 2%, that feels like an awful lot. The other reason is, a lot of writing for me is trying to say things in a way that um, is new, um, that actually has significance. Um, why do Hallmark cards, do you have Hallmark cards here? Why are they not that great? You know, why are they not that great? They're not that great because everyone buys them and gives them to everyone. Do what, I, is, what is a Hallmark card? It's like a little greeting card that says, thinking of you on your birthday, I really love you a lot. Okay. And so you think, who has sent this to whom? And why should I care? Like, tell me something original. Tell me something that you mean. Tell me something in a way that you haven't said it to somebody else and in a way that nobody has said it to anybody else. Um, that's the struggle in life. And like the simple forms are telling, telling somebody that you like them, you know? How can you tell somebody you like them when people are telling that to other people all the time, all across the world? How many times has I love you been said in the history of humankind? Um, hundreds of trillions of times. But you want your, when you say it, you want it to mean something. And when somebody says it to you, you want it to mean something. So you find other ways of saying it. You usually set it in some sort of nice context or you, you know, your facial expression reveals something or you incorporate it into a poem or whatever it is. You make it something new. Both Alex and Oscar benefit from their like limited capabilities with language because they're forced to say things new. Um, they don't really have a choice. Um, when Alex says um, he's angry, he says he's spleened, you know, and that is not something that people have said to each other millions and millions of times. Um, maybe in Ukraine. Maybe in the Ukraine. They speak Ukrainian in the Ukraine. He um, probably it's a, it's a borrowed word. <laughs> He, uh, and so it actually means something. That's why when you read it, it's kind of funny or kind of strikes the right chord. And with Oscar, his lack of experience, his inability to like censor himself or to know what adults say in the world, because of that, without his choosing, he ends up saying things in a different way. He has heavy boots. And, you know, if he were to say he was depressed, we would know what that meant. If he were to say he was unhappy, he felt weighted down, he felt immobile, we would know what that meant. He says he has heavy boots. That is different. And... When I wrote it, I thought, that's right. That's what I've been feeling, is heavy boots. I haven't been feeling depression or unhappiness or sad. Someone once told me that in Hebrew, there wasn't a word for frustrated until, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. 
So, <laughs> because no, because you know, the, the second intifada. Or they, had to, uh, <laughs> they had to modernize the language. There weren't words for all sorts of things. And so there's the person speculated was nobody frustrated in Israel before that. I guess I guess they weren't frustrated because you can't be something that you can't describe. It's impossible. That's why kids don't babies don't have complex thoughts because they have no words. Um, so when you can apply a new word, you can actually bring a new emotion into existence. You know, you can bring heavy boots into existence because it really isn't like anything else. And that's what excites me about writing is bringing new things into existence that we all feel but we didn't have words for before. And so far, it won't be this way in the future, so far having narrators who um, are limited communicators. It's one of those funny things that is the constraint is the liberation. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much. This was an evening of very light boots, I would say. And I, uh, there's something Monique still wants to say, and I'd well, like to thank you I think very much for this conversation. Yeah. Thank you. First, a big applause.